forward. Hey everyone, uh, I've got the huge pleasure of uh, spending some time with a uh, great colleague and uh, dare I say friend, Bonnie Stewart. Uh, she's someone who I've known for probably about 12, 15 years. I met her through her ne'er-do-well partner, um, who we won't mention by name. And uh, But Bonnie has been one of those people that's been really actively involved in the online space for, for as long as I've known her. Uh, she's an exquisite writer and she's done some fantastic work around just the experience of being digital. She was involved in an early paper that uh, she led and uh, well, we were involved in around uh, the experience of MOOCs and moving online well before that was a big thing. So Bonnie, great to have you. Thanks for taking time for a quick chat. Great to talk to you, George. So by way of background, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? What's your research and what do you do? Well, I did my PhD in Twitter before Twitter got scary and weird. Um, basically, I'm, I'm an educator. I've been, I've been in education and in digital education for about 20 years now. And I was working in um, sort of uh, at the intersection of international and digital ed in about 2010 um, when got hooked into some, some early MOOC research. And from there started looking at, because I was blogging at the same time and noticing the ways in which kind of networked communities operated and brought people together and was interested in how that worked for education. So started looking at this space called academic Twitter and how folks who were normally engaged in sharing their ideas in really kind of slow peer reviewed journal sort of ways were able to also at the same time build both community and academic reputations in a space that only allowed them at that time 140 characters. From there and during the, even the time I was doing that, I was studying Twitter around the time that Gamergate happened and Twitter became, kind of be, began to develop the reputation that it has now, which is less of a community supportive space and more of a hey, come get yelled at by some people you don't even know. Um, and so I, I pulled back a little bit from, from Twitter itself, although I'm, I'm still there personally, but from studying Twitter um, and started looking into, my, my more recent research is into data, um, datafication, and like so sort of the societal phenomenon of everything extracting data from us as we engage online. And what does it mean for educators when we're bringing students into those spaces. And for those of us who work in online education, what does it mean when every space that we want to use with students, and now with COVID-19, that all of us seem to work in online education, surprise, suddenly, um, what does it mean when we are bringing students into spaces that we may not understand the implications of? Those are great points, especially the, the transition that you noted about network spaces. So there's a way in which network spaces can be polluted, if you will, and that's something for educators to be uniquely aware of. There's two strands, I think, in what you just shared that, that really should be of interest to people who are now starting to teach. One strand is the fact that there is theoretically an equitable approach to participation and engagement that is possible when you participate in network spaces. We've also seen the flip side of that, though, that there's also a disaster that can occur as it becomes a contentious space. The second part of it is the fact that data is, has always been collected with our interaction online. And initially it was just, oh, this is nice. And, and I was involved in some early work around learning analytics, being able to understand mm -hmm. learning processes through data. But even that mm -hmm. has now no longer become a research thing. It's almost a surveillance and a manipulation thing. So wh what do you say to, to teachers who are starting to go online with this reality that a space can have terrific affordances of participation yeah. and engagement? or it can provide a data source for effectively understanding learning and engagement. But the same account, these places can go sour quickly. Like, what, do you, what would you advise to teachers who are just getting into this space now to harness the best of those environments while recognizing that there can be some significant downside for themselves and their students? I think the, the big thread for me through all of it is around power, right? And if we look at classrooms, classrooms also have power relations. Um, some people get to talk more, some people get listened to more, all of those things. No classroom is a pure or equitable space. And so I think the idea that, oh my goodness, like it is absolutely important to analyze 
the power relations of any space that we're teaching in, including the face-to-face -face classroom. If we're not actively already involved in that, I wouldn't worry over much more about the power relations on the digital space, or at least use that as a, oh, well, I can't go there because that exists there. It exists everywhere you are. It exists in every single space that you teach in, and that it's a fundamental part of pedagogy, right? How we approach the idea of teaching has to do with um, questions of power, and there, there is no space that is truly 100% equitable without us constantly kind of doing work in that direction. Um, so when you are bringing students into online spaces, consider things like your pedagogy and your approach, um, things like how you're going to make it more than just sort of putting three hour lectures up for them to watch that you're expecting them to watch every blessed moment of um, and then testing them in high stakes ways. I think we need to be approaching this current moment with a pedagogy of care and consideration and also the recognition that no space we, the students have ever been in is pure and there are ways in which you can do things in these spaces that connect students to others and allow them to you know get meaning and and particularly when we're all socially isolated um some kind of social connection from each other those can be good things um my my work for years has been based um, partly in sort of the theoretical work of Donna Haraway. And she talks about the polluted inheritance of the enlightenment and reason. And I don't want to start a fight with you here, George, but objectivity. Um, and, but, but that we, we need these inheritances, right? That every space we work in has its polluted elements. And turning away from that and saying, oh, well, I don't go where there's pollution is lying to ourselves. Rather, look it in the face, look at, okay, what are the things about this that is different from the power relations my students are used to? What is the kind of pedagogy I can use that's gonna be kindest in this moment? What is the lowest stakes kind of onboarding for me and my students that I can do that is going to put you know, the least pressure on us while we're worried about what's happening in the world and what's happening with family and, and that kind of stuff? How can we use this to get done the very basic things that we need to do while taking advice from folks, and it's great that you're putting all this together, um, around, okay, here are some spaces that are reasonably fair for educational use, right? So in terms of the data pieces, um, if, we're, if we're, you and I are, are talking on Zoom, um, my, I've run a project this past year with my Bachelor of Education students where we realized that, um, my pre-service teachers, my faculty colleagues, and the teachers in the K-12 system are all on the same learning curve in terms of, there's all these tech tools out there, but how does anybody assess them and how does anybody take the time to read the 17 page terms of service that are only meant to be read by lawyers? So my students did that for you. So if you actually wanted to, anybody wanted to look at um, the uwindsor.ca slash education slash open page, there is a little tool parade of about 15 videos and 11 podcasts, all by uh, pre-service teachers. The videos are all three to five minutes about different tools, including things like Zoom and Twitter. Um, from an educator's point of view, what are the data implications for, doing, for using these tools with students? How can you use them for differentiated learning to reach more students, to actually connect them in ways that maybe paper and pen can't? Um, so there, there, there are resources out there for considering what is safe to use. And most of the tools that are being recommended right now in this current moment are educational tools. They have data implications. We should understand them, but we don't need to become lawyers in order to go, okay, it's all right to use Zoom with our students. Yeah, and some you know critical things to to be reflective of whether it is the the fact that these spaces create uneven power relationships, and I think for many faculty that first attempt to teach online, it can be a bit jarring to also realize that one of the first things that happens is you lose power, because yeah. suddenly the team can shape a conversation. You don't have the microphone the way you do in a classroom. Mm -hmm. You may pop in and still direct and shape a conversation, but by and large. Yeah. You, you, you do have, because if there's anyone that's privileged and has power, it's faculty. It's, you shape the conversations, you shape the topic, first and foremost. So many cases when you go online, 
the first person that most dramatically loses their influence or not lose, that's maybe we're stating it, but that experiences the shock of no longer being the exclusive shining light is, is a jarring one for, for faculty because they can find resources that says, hey, this person taught stats way better than you're doing this. Or mm -hmm. this, this uh, you know, chemistry prof I found on YouTube, she does a bang up job getting this point across that I didn't understand what the heck you were talking mm -hmm. about in the classroom. So, and I, I would um, encourage, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, I would encourage faculty, if you are, particularly if you are doing a few synchronous things over the coming weeks and months, and I wouldn't encourage you to be doing a ton because that's hard for students to show up for, et cetera. But um, the first time I taught synchronously online, I realized that I'm doing my little mini piece before I break students out to do things together, but they're all in the chat and they're not off topic like they're not talking about their favorite music but they're not they're having a whole side conversation that didn't follow the thread of what i was going on about and the first time that happened i was offended and i was like what? yeah and then i was like <laughs> bonnie they're having a discussion that is actually and, and so i started keeping the chat open and reading it and then shaping what i was talking about to kind of fit what was going on in the chat so there, there's there's a certain amount of of um learning to see differently the kinds of yeah. responses that we get online. Well, and that's a really important point because networks change power relationships, but they don't change power. Yep. And so what I've found in the past, and this I was still at Athabasca, is I would find students would be creating Slack channels that they didn't invite me to. Like how rude, mm -hmm. like wh why would they want a space without my input? It's offensive. <laughs> how could they learn without you? <sighs> Precisely. Um, so you know, these are really, really great points. And, and if you, uh, one of things we'll, we'll share with uh, the video that we, we posted is a couple of uh, resources to articles or uh, outputs, publications and resources. You mentioned the U Windsor site and others that individuals can go look at for a little more yeah. guidance. I think the point you just made around the digital, uh, don't plan on synchronous instruction. Recognize that there's a different role for you in a network than there is in a classroom. So if you could say just a few things as a final point, you've got faculty now ground zero. They don't know what social media is necessarily, or mm -hmm. if they do, they don't participate. They uh, are not familiar with how to navigate, say, Twitter or WhatsApp or TikTok, and they have no interest mm -hmm. in figuring it out. What would you say to this type of a profile of a teacher? What should they be mm -hmm. aware of in going into a digital teaching environment? And it may only be for two or three months. It may be the start of a longer trend for them in their career. I would say it's going to be okay. And you don't need to know as much as you think you might because your students don't know as much as you think they probably do. Like I said, I did my PhD in Twitter. I've never used TikTok and I'm only considering getting an Instagram account tomorrow, like 12 years later, because um, Debbie Allen from fame in the 80s, like I'm going to live forever, is doing a free dance lesson on Instagram and I'm working from home. So I think that means that I'm actually going to um, learn to dance. Uh, so, hey, uh, students, the idea of the digital native is garbage. Students know how to use certain things you are learning how to use a different thing and you will still be leading some of that conversation with them and no one is sitting out there judging you every time that i start an online class and i use blackboard collaborate at my institution i've been using it for years we have tech fails we have problems i'm out there going students are you there hello can anyone hear me or my mic fails or whatever it happens to everybody it's okay. That's what I would say. It's going to be okay. That's a great point on which to end because there's a lot of pressure. I'm sure both students and teachers are feeling about this transition. And I think recognizing you, you put the best forward that you can. And uh, yeah. you, I think you need to approach it almost with an air of good faith and trust, uh, trusting that your students want you to succeed trusting yeah. that your institution wants you to succeed and trusting that mm -hmm. of course there's you know fantastic colleagues like uh, you know, yourself and others that are freely yeah. sharing and learning in different online spaces so it's not that they're walking this journey uh, alone uh, so yeah. dr bonnie stewart a real privilege to be able to connect with you again thanks for your insight thanks for your time george good luck everybody